Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. When I married Jillian, or Jill as she preferred to be called, I had no idea about the nightmare that would unfold. My name is Tony Rowan. As I mentioned, my wife's name is Jill. When we got married, I was sure that we would grow old together and enjoy our grandchildren. I started my own business as a consulting engineer two years after we got married. Jill worked for a small medical supplies company. We both agreed to get settled and save some money before starting a family. For eight years, we were happy and our sex life was great. I honestly thought I married the perfect woman. I bought a small cottage in a quiet alley. Inside, it needed a lot of repair, but structurally, it was sound. Our nearest neighbor was 200 yards away, and there were only six other houses in the alley. It took almost a year, and the house was finally finished. We did most of the work ourselves. I had to hire workers to do some plumbing and electrical work. I was glad that the job was done. Jill and I often talked about how perfect it would be when we finally had children. Everything went wrong just before our ninth anniversary. Jill often became very harsh with me. Add that to the fact that our bed life was practically dead, and I started to get mad at her attitude. Jill started dating girls from work a few nights a week, or so she said. Wherever they went, it must have been nice, because she never came home before midnight. I began to think the worst, but I reasoned that she would never cheat on me, even though I didn't realize how wrong I was. I had a childhood friend who I turned to for advice. Barry Patton and I have been friends since we met in our freshman year of high school. When my company expanded and I needed an executive director, I turned to Barry because he was someone I could trust. Barry knew Jill and at first couldn't believe what I was telling him. But after learning the details, he changed his mind. All the signs are there, Tony. If you want my opinion, I think Jill is cheating on you. I'm sorry to break the bad news, but I'd bet my career on it. When Barry said that, I knew he wasn't joking. I thanked him and returned to my office. I was sitting at my desk, thinking about what to do in this situation. If Jill was cheating, then that was it. Our marriage was over. The bad thing was that she would get half of everything I owned. I was looking for a private investigator and found someone who could meet me later that day. When I explained my concerns to Joe Amos, the private investigator assured me that if Jill was cheating, he would get the evidence I needed and I left his office feeling a little better. Deep down, I hoped and prayed that I was wasting my money on his services. The next day, I met with a technician at the cottage so that he could install some hidden cameras. He also connected a voice recorder to a telephone line. I didn't think it would show anything. Jill wasn't stupid enough to use her home phone if she was cheating. A week later, I contacted Joe and the news was disgusting. All this is in the report and the DVD is very visual. If I were you, I wouldn't watch it. Knowing is one thing, but seeing is a completely different game. Thanking Joe for his advice, I paid him the last fee and left with the report and the DVD. Back in my office, I didn't follow Joe's advice and watch the DVD. The report revealed that her so-called outings with the girls were a cover for her to make love to some jerk she was working with. They took several long lunches and afternoon off to go and make love at a motel a few miles away. The report also said that they went to his house several times. The DVD was recorded on Thursday. Jill arrived home in the afternoon with a man. They immediately went into the bedroom and made love like wild animals for several hours. Jill did everything for him. What really shocked and disgusted me was what Jill said to her lover. I need to meet you and the guys again. What we have is great. It's paradise. I had never met a guy with whom she made love, except for a large male organ. There was not much to choose between him and me. I had a decent 20 centimeters but it was at least five centimeters longer. We were both about the same age and build. With the evidence, I planned to catch them at the cottage, beat the shit out of it, and throw Jill out on the street. The following Thursday, I left work and drove past where we lived. And sure enough, Jill's car and another one I didn't know were parked in the driveway. I parked on the street and headed to my house. Going inside, I heard them enjoying a stormy love upstairs. I burst into the bedroom and yelled at this jerk to get out of my house. It turned out to be a bad move. Since it was another jerk, the guy was much over six feet tall and must have weighed a hundred pounds more than me. I saw him walking towards me and then everything went dark. When I came to, I was tied to a chair with a gag in my mouth. Jill was lying on the bed making love to three guys and screaming at them to do it harder. Eventually, one of them noticed that I was awake. Hey, look, the little weakling is awake. They all laughed. 
I watched as Jill freed herself from the mass of bodies on the bed and walked over to where I was sitting. The woman I married was standing there smiling. Her face was covered in liquid, and drops were running down her leg. She pulled the gag out of my mouth. Why, Jill? Why do this to us? I realized that being married to you is boring. I want to have fun, and all you need is kids and a wife at home to look after you. Well, that's not going to happen. You thought you could barge in and ruin my fun, didn't you? Jill stared at me with a sickly smile on her face. As you can see, I have three real men here who are satisfying me now, so I don't need you anymore, you and your worthless little male organ. Now that we're done, my friends are going to take you somewhere. I hope you like it. I didn't know the woman standing in front of me. Of course it wasn't my wife. Jill wouldn't do that to me, would she? One of the guys came up and hit me hard in the face. The lights went out. I blacked out. When I moved, it was dark and it took me a few seconds to get my bearings. I knew that I was lying on my side with my wrists and ankles tied, and I had a hood on my head. Movement told me that I was in a vehicle, and judging by the cold metal floor, I assumed it was some kind of van. It looks like he's waking up again. Well, it saves us from having to carry this body. We're almost there. I got a little jolted when the car was driving on a bumpy road or dirt track. My head hurt from the blow I received. I was glad when the car stopped. I had no idea that it would have been better if they had continued to drive. Untie his legs. At least he will be able to walk his last few steps. The last few steps. I suddenly realized that I was about to be killed. Or so it seemed to me. I was led over some uneven ground and I almost fell several times. Get up, you bastard. I'm not going to carry you. Now go. A voice instructed me when a hand slapped the back of my head. I silently prayed that whatever they were going to do to me would be quick. And if that was my fate, then get it over with as soon as possible. I stood there, waiting to hear the click of a loaded pistol. The hood on my head did not allow me to see anything. Suddenly they started kicking and punching me, and I fell to the ground. The blows continued until my battered body lay motionless. I knew I was still alive, barely, but still alive. I felt a hand touch my neck, fingers gently moving around. There is no pulse. He's dead. Should we bury him or leave him here? To hell with it. Leave him here. There's no one around for miles, and if his body is ever found, there won't be much left of him anyway. If the guy who was checking on me knew what he was doing, he would have felt my pulse. But where his fingers touched my neck, he had no chance. I could hear the attackers laughing at me as they left. I lay motionless for what seemed to me like several hours. In fact, it must have been ten minutes or so. I didn't move until I heard the sound of a car driving away in the distance. As I lay on the ground, I wondered what made Jill hate me so much. What made her become a woman of easy virtue, loving a big male organ? I've always treated her right. I remembered her comment about my tiny organ at my 20 centimeters, I would not call it tiny. Pain shot through my body as I tried to stand up. It took several attempts as my wrists were tied. Finally, I managed to stand up. My body ached as if I had been hit by a truck. I knew that the first thing I had to do was try to remove the hood from my head, which was beaten and mutilated. I didn't want to wander around in total darkness. Walking slowly, I came across a bush or something like that and pressed my head against it, trying to take off my hood. Eventually the hood caught and I was able to get out of it, my eyes adjusted to the other darkness. To be honest, my left eye was closed and it wasn't much use anyway. I just hoped that what happened wasn't forever. When my eyes got used to the darkness, I had no idea where I was. All I knew was that I had been left in a forest or thicket. Slowly I moved along the path that seemed to me the easiest. I was in no condition to climb up after some kind of fall. I'm not an ex-military man or anything like that. Just a normal guy who didn't want to die. It took everything I had left to just wander in one direction. And some time later, still in great pain, I noticed a light in the distance. As I approached the light source, I realized that it was a cottage or a farmhouse and found enough energy in myself to get to the gate. Trying to open it was beyond my strength, I screamed. And suddenly everything was plunged into darkness again. When I managed to open my eyes, the left one was still closed. I noticed that I was in the room. I tried to sit up. The pain was too much, and I flopped onto my back. Please don't move. Obviously you had an accident or something. I looked up and saw a woman standing over me. Who are you? How did I get here? I found you outside the house last night. I heard you scream. 
and when I looked around, you were lying on the ground unconscious. I remembered trying to open the gate. Now lie still and tell me what happened, if you can remember. Oh, I remembered everything perfectly. I just wasn't sure if it was worth discussing it with this strange woman. My name is Rosemary. You can call me Rosie. I prefer it that way. So how the hell did you end up in this state? It's a long story and I'm not sure if I should tell you. My ribs hurt whenever I tried to speak or breathe heavily. Should I call the police? No, please. No police. I promise you that I won't hurt you and I'll tell you what happened. Just not right now. Rosie smiled. I must have passed out because I don't remember anything after that. The next time I woke up, Rosie was in the room, and this time I managed to sit up. Rosie fluffed up a couple of pillows so I could sit up properly. I saw that my torso was wrapped in bandages, and there were several cuts on my arms and legs. Do you have a mirror? Rosie nodded and handed me a small mirror. I almost dropped it when I saw my reflection. My lips were cut and swollen. My left eye was blackened and swollen. My right eye was badly bruised, and I had several more cuts on my face. Now are you ready to tell me who you are and what happened? I nodded my head. I told Rosie everything I could remember, from finding Jill in bed with three men to trying to open her gate. Tony, you really should call the police, you know that. No, please don't. I will deal with this in my own way and in my own time. The last thing I need is police intervention. Have it your way and do what you have to do. Now I do not know where you live or anything like that, so you better stay here until you are mobile and healthy enough to leave. I thanked Rosie for her kindness. I had no idea who this woman was. I think she was about 45 years old. That is, a good 10 years older than me. Rosie let me use her phone to call Barry and let him know that I was okay. Tony? Where the hell have you been? Everyone is going crazy trying to find you. Jill was here, terribly worried that you were missing. Barry, can you do me a favor, please? If Jill asks, you haven't heard from me at all. I promise that I will explain everything at the next meeting. If something comes up at work, I trust you to deal with it. I ended the conversation and Barry seemed satisfied. Rosie asked me what my plans were. I'm going to rest until I can move around and get back home. After that, I'm going to make some people pay for everything. I don't know how yet, but they will pay. Rosie just nodded and smiled. Do what you have to do, Tony, but please be careful. It suddenly dawned on me that other than knowing her name, I didn't know anything about Rosie. And come to think of it, I had no idea where I was. When Rosie told me the name of the nearest village, I figured I must have been at least three hours away from home. Rosie fed and cared for me, and it wasn't until a few weeks later that I felt well enough to leave. I told Rosie I'd call and ask someone to pick me up. I'll drop you off at the train station in the village. Whoever you call will never find this place. It's too remote. I barely got into Rosie's little car, proof that I wasn't fully recovered yet. I thanked Rosie for everything. Her answer was simple. Do what you have to do, Tony, but please be careful. I sat and waited for Barry to pick me up. Jesus Christ, Tony, what the hell happened to you? Barry asked as he appeared. On the way back, I told Barry everything, and he shook his head in disbelief. I think I know why she did it, Barry. If we get divorced, she gets half of everything. Jill is greedy and wants to get everything. I bet she promised her hookup buddies a bunch of cash if they got rid of me. She knows the company is worth millions. I think she would sell it and spend her days making love to whoever wants her. You can stay at my place, buddy. If anyone asks, I'll tell them I have no idea where you are. Thanks, Barry. Do me a favor. Please bring my laptop from the office. Oh, and I'm going to need some clothes. Barry laughed and said he felt like he was harboring a fugitive. Not yet, but it can happen if I get caught taking revenge. Well, then you'd better not get caught. I don't want to know what you're planning. On the way, we stopped at a shopping mall. I managed to get some jeans, t-shirts, socks, underwear, and a pair of sneakers. At the moment, this is quite enough. I had a full wardrobe at home, or at least I hoped it was. Fortunately, it was dark when we arrived at Barry's house, and I could only imagine the neighbors talking about me. According to Barry, Jill played the role of a loving wife very well. She called everyone who knew me. That is, everyone except the police. She called Barry regularly, every day, and asked if he had heard from me. Of course, his answer was no. Gradually, I recovered and was able to walk without experiencing severe pain. Barry told me that Jill's calls have now been reduced to one call a week. I assumed she was too busy enjoying herself to worry about me. Sometimes it's useful to have time to think. In my case, it led me to think about how terrible my revenge would be. I wanted to take real revenge and I was analyzing the options. 
Sitting around all day, I came up with several ways to deal with Jill and her bedfellows. The problem was that most of my ideas involved involving someone else. This is something I wasn't ready for. My hatred led me to what is known as the dark web. After reading it, it became clear that I could hire a hitman if I wanted to. There were several references to mechanics, a term from the dark internet denoting an assassin. Eventually, I came up with a plan, but I had no idea how to make it a reality. And out of desperation and hatred, I left a message asking for help in solving a chemical problem. Naturally, I had a few messages from some psychos, but there was one who seemed to understand what I was getting at. I replied to his message. After a few more messages, I was convinced that the guy was sincere. He seemed satisfied that I was not from law enforcement. He sent me a program to install, and it encrypted our messages. After logging out and closing the VRN software, I searched the internet for what I was advised to purchase. Since I needed to get specific brand names, it took a little longer than expected. Once I had everything I needed, I realized that in order for this to work, I needed to know when Jill and the lovers would be in the house. When I returned to the internet, I bought several listening devices, bugs. Barry and I sat and talked most evenings. He never asked me what I planned to do, and I never told him. Things were going well, and the company had attracted several new clients. I assured Barry that I would most likely be back at the office in a week or two. When the bugs arrived, I returned to the house. Jill's car was parked in the driveway. Maybe she had a quiet night last night. I didn't know, and I didn't care. I watched Jill leave the house, and five minutes later I went inside. Thank God it didn't occur to her to change the locks. Apparently she was sure that I was dead, so there was no reason to worry. I installed a bug in the living room and in the bedroom. I must say that despite the fact that she had men in her house, it was clean and tidy. There were clean sheets on the bed and no signs that anyone else was there. That evening, I heard Jill talking to a man. I recognized the voice of one of the men from the van. He was there, used Jill, and informed her that he had made an appointment with the others for Friday night. Oh my God, I love your big organ. How many of them will be here? Jill asked. I managed to persuade nine guys. There would be ten of them, but one of them won't be able to come this week. Nine is enough for me. Now take me. All these conversations turn me on and make me wet. I turned off my laptop. I didn't need to hear them making love. I hoped he would like it, because if my plan worked, then no one would sleep with Jill after Friday. On Friday evening, I was sitting in the bushes in front of our house, waiting for the start of the fire. And finally, Jill arrived home, accompanied by several other cars following her. I gave them 30 minutes, and figuring that would be enough time for them to get started, I walked slowly to the back door. I heard a noise upstairs. Jill was screaming for them to make love faster, and everyone else was cheerfully cheering her on. I went upstairs quietly, stopped to make sure everyone was in the bedroom. I poured the first liquid onto the carpet, leaving a path back to the kitchen, then repeated the same with the second liquid. The person who explained it to me was right about one thing. When they were mixed together, there was almost no smell. He warned me that the more I use, the stronger the end result. Back in the kitchen, I was faced with the difficult part. If I mess it up, we're all going to hell. The third liquid, in fact, served as a trigger. As soon as she mixes with others and reacts, all hell will break loose. I poured the liquid into a puddle next to the other two. I thought it would take them a few minutes to come into contact with each other. Slowly and noiselessly, I went out the door, closing it softly behind me. I raced down the path to the place where I parked the rented car. As I was driving away, I saw a powerful bright flash in the rearview mirror. I didn't stop. I just drove until I got to Barry's house. Fortunately, Barry had a date and he wasn't at home when I got there. I took a shower and went to bed. The next morning, I drove up to the house. I acted like I wanted to let Jill know that I was alive, despite the best efforts of her friends. Another part of the performance was to collect my clothes and some personal belongings, even though I knew they were all burned. When I turned into an alley, a policeman stopped me. I'm sorry, sir, you can't go any further. But I live here, just down the road at Laurel Cottage. Park the car and wait here, please. The officer approached the cottage. Moments later, he returned with a guy in a suit. Mr. Rowan, I'm Detective Inspector Hobson. Do you mind if I ask where you were last night? I was at home. Well, actually, I live with a friend. My wife and I live separately. How long have you been staying with this friend? A couple of months. Now I just came to pick up my last clothes and personal belongings. 
Unfortunately, there was a fire in the cottage last night. Can I see it? I mean, after all, this is my house, or was it? We walked along the path together. The detective asked me more questions. Did I keep flammable materials at home? No, by no means. There was a small gasoline canister in the barn. I use it to refuel my lawnmower. The cottage has turned into a complete ruin. The wall collapsed at one end. The roof sagged at a very uncomfortable angle. As you can see, sir, the fire destroyed the building. No one except firefighters and rescuers are allowed inside. They are currently removing the bodies. Did your wife have any friends last night? I have no idea. As I said, we broke up. I do not know what she did last night. You said they were removing the bodies. How many of them are there? Ten so far. They think that there are no more bodies. They are just finally checking. I stood there and looked shocked, just like anyone else in my place. I thanked the detective and went back to my car. When I was a few miles away, I called Barry. I explained the situation to him, and Barry assured me that he would confirm that we were at home all night. Naturally, I was asked about the fire. I told the police that Jill and I had broken up. I told them that I would stay with Barry until we sorted everything out. The investigation of the fire was completed two months later. It was recognized as an accident as a result, probably, of a malfunction of the gas appliance. The coroner recorded verdicts of accidental death in relation to those who died in the fire, one woman and nine men. In my statement, I pointed out that Jill was probably throwing a party with one of her work colleagues. Since we were separated, I didn't have a better answer. I attended Jill's funeral more for decency than anything else, and when the coffin was lowered into the ground, I threw in a handful of earth and one rose. There was a postcard pinned to the stem of the rose. I wrote on it, Burn in hell, bitch. Most of those present probably thought it was a personal gesture of love. Yes, exactly, as if it could be. Jill's mother actually asked me why I wasn't at home that night, and what was Jill doing in the house with nine men. We were separated pending a divorce. As for why she had nine men in her house, you figure it out for yourself. I turned and walked away. I moved out of Barry's house into a small furnished apartment. The only serious loss was having to replace my entire wardrobe. In the end, the insurance company paid for the house. I sold the plot to the developer, as I did not want to rebuild it. The media speculated about why there were nine men and one woman in the house that night. I didn't comment and let people come to their own conclusions. As for the nine men, I didn't know any of them and didn't pay attention to the newspaper reports about their funerals. I tried to come back to thank Rosie for saving me. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the cottage despite asking some locals where it is. Barry never asked me about the fire. He actually offered to set up a date with me if I was interested. Right now, I just want to get on with my life, especially since there is a woman who lives in the same apartment building as me. We haven't talked yet, except to say hello to each other. If we really start dating and it really gets serious, then the prenuptial agreement will be concluded before I get married again.